Hello, this is Turbodog702 for Castlevania Lords of Shadow. Uh, this is going to be a marathon submission video where I do commentary on it. Uh, in the background, I'm just going to have some of the music playing from the soundtrack here, uh, as I can't really have captured the noise with the, the method that I used without the microphone on. So we're just going to do that. Just to give you a quick overview, um, the top of the screen has my inputs on my controller. Uh, that's not an in-game thing. Uh, as a preface, this is New Game Plus uh, any percent with full power. What full power is, is it's a category using the All Upgrades Cheat uh, that is available inside of the game. What it gives you is that it gives you full resources on either Restart from Checkpoint or Finishing a Chapter. It allows for much, much more varied strategies, uh, allows you to be very much more aggressive with your resources. Uh, just in general is a much safer way to do marathons as well. Uh, I could do New Game Plus without full power as well. Uh, that would change the estimate uh, considerably though, but I'll try to give you guys an estimate on that as well. Uh, right now the category is slightly in flux due to the implementation of an infinite jump in certain stages. Uh, this run does not use that, but I will be sure to modify my estimate as such if it becomes more relevant and I'm able to practice it enough. But uh, let's go ahead and get into the run. So Lords of Shadow, we do every chapter and level except for the DLC ones, which begins with the Besieged Village. We play on the PC as it is considerably faster loading and much better frame rate. Uh, we use Silver Knives here to deal with this first barrage of Lycanthropes. Uh, the reason for that is weapons in this game are treated more as kind of like pop rock, paper, scissors. I'll get more into that in a second. Nice little QTE here. Uh, we use the Shadow Magic Tornado to be able to kill this wolf. It's a little bit faster than any other option. Uh, we're going to QTE our way to victory here. Uh, you have to hit this phase, and it's important to hit this prompt to pick up this stake, otherwise the boss will regenerate health. So you have to hit this the first time every time. Luckily, it's an extremely generous window. And we're going to head into the second stage, which is kind of an auto-scroller. Uh, main thing to note about the auto-scroller portion of this is that we want to fail the QTEs to get on the ground quicker to get into combat. Otherwise, you would get pulled to the ground and get into a combat situation anyway. Uh, so back to what I was saying about kind of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, lycanthropes die immediately to silver daggers if it's a lesser lycanthrope, which is why they use them here. Uh, dagger wave ability here to put both of those lycanthropes at the same time. Uh, but other special abilities, you have the silver daggers, you have holy water, you have a dark crystal, which we'll get into a little bit later, and fairies. Uh, each of these can be modified using your light or dark magic system, uh, depending on what weapon it is. For example, if you infuse the daggers with dark magic, you can make them explode. Nice little use of ultimate light here to be able to deal with that wolf a lot faster than normal. So Deadbog is the first stage where we're going to start to see how broken this game is in New Game Plus. New Game Plus allows you access to all of the relics, upgrades, and weapons that you got normally. Um, so because of that, we can kind of bypass some of the platforming elements of the game. I have a little bit of trouble grabbing onto this. Um, that's just kind of a weird proposition here. Here I'm going to be doing a backwards long jump using double jumps and avalanche punches. I'm going to be doing it again here. The reason we're doing this is to bypass a lengthy arena that takes place there with a bunch of goblins. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with 3D games like God of War and... Uh, kind of games of that vintage. Uh, the idea of the long jump and the high jump are pretty universal between them. And what it comes down to is you use these techniques in order to gain two to three times the amount of height or length of a jump that the developers intended you to get. And by doing that, you can break games wide open with different collision bugs, getting on top of geometry or invisible geometry to really sequence break games. It's kind of an old strat where we use the bombs to break down the tree. There's a new strat where we super jump over this using kind of a glitchy ability. Uh, we're going to approach the next area here. 
Uh, there is a way that you can skip over kind of the loading phases of this next area, but particularly on the PC version, it's not really worth doing. Um, it just takes way longer uh, to do that and is, well, it doesn't take way longer to skip the arenas, but it's much more risky and on one to two failures it starts losing time. So instead, we're immediately going to go in and we're going to meet the first boss of the game, which is a Swamp Troll. But uh, we know that we might have trouble dealing with Shrek, so uh, we're just going to release some fairies. And then uh, we're just going to high jump out of there and tell him, give him the peace sign and just say later. So, <laughs> nice little out-of-bounds jump here to bypass a little bit of climbing. Uh, normally there's a large climbing section involved with that whole section there. But using the double jump, we can kind of bypass it. Grappling points are kind of weird in that you have to wait until they activate before you can actually use them. But a lot of times they activate from quite a distance away, as you saw there. Pan's Temple, very simple. Um, you're just trying to find a code and then input it into a kind of door puzzle. And then later on, there will be a puzzle where we have to talk to the dead spirit of Marie, your dead wife. So kind of talking a little bit about this, uh, we have a sprint that you're seeing me use. That's an ability that you get at the end of Chapter 3 from the First Lord of Shadow. Uh, it allows you to run, and right now this is kind of the fastest overland movement that we have that's non-conditional. You're seeing that I'm jumping at the end of it. It seems like jumping preserves momentum kind of perfectly, and we're able to get away with that. There is a slight touch of nudity in this game, but it is definitely not the focus of it, so I don't think that that's going to be a real issue in particular. A lot of it is very understated as well, such as on, like, statues in the background. That's probably one of the more blatant things, it's just the fairy in the foreground, but it's... I don't think it should be an issue. <laughs> Very simple puzzle here, uh, just redirecting these rings so that Gabriel can reach the center platform. A very typical survival horror puzzle. Uh, the rings, you turn the rings either clockwise or counterclockwise, and then the rings adjacent to your ring will move the opposite direction. Pretty easy puzzle, especially when you know the solution. Solution is constant as well. So, we're getting towards the end of chapter one, and we're going to get introduced to one of the major things that kind of had turned people off about this game, which is like, they're like, oh, it's a God of War clone. Oh, now it's a Shadow of the Colossus clone, and it's ripping them off. So, what, the way I feel is that Games are always going to inspire other games, <laughs> right? So it's not really the biggest issue here. Right here we're using the Dark Crystal, which is an ability that normally wipes screens clean and kills all enemies. It does significant damages to bosses. We're using it here on this Titan because we want to reduce the amount of phases it takes to fight him. Um, kind of return to my point on the ripoff thing here in a little bit. But uh, for now we need to wait for two punches in order to get onto the titan once we get onto the titan we use the jumping move to kind of traverse across the titan because it's a little faster than just moving normally unfortunately at this point there's no real way to sequence break the titans or at least most of them uh, the principle of the titans is you want to get to their powered glyphs and hit them and once you hit them enough times they break and the boss kind of change phases like this, and you get to the next cliff, rinse and repeat until you're done with the fight. What's nice is by using the Dark Crystal, we make it so we have to hit each glyph only once. Which speeds this up considerably. Swing around to the back here. Uh, the main component of this first Titan is that... And all Titans really shakes. So when the Titan shakes, depending on what phase of the fight you're in, uh, you might need to hold on for 
one shake, two shake, or three shakes, and each shake is a considerable amount of time that you're spent standing still in order to hold on to the Titan. So if you're going to get shakes, you want them on certain phases of the fight where you're going to get less of them. Uh, unfortunately, due to the way that this game works, a lot of the times we miss out on some of the cool kill animations, but I don't know, maybe that can be an incentive or something to watch the boss kills. Little traversal here down the cliff side. Uh, chapter 2, as we're in right now, is now where the game's going to start breaking like in half. Like We saw a little bit on the dead bog, the third stage of chapter 1. But a good portion of stages from here on out are going to be snapped in half, basically. Running past uh, these werewolves here. It's not worth our time to fight them. Just continue on. I unfortunately got a buffered perfect parry there, which is pretty rare. Actually, that's, I think, only one of two times in a ton of runs I've gotten that. Using the double jump, we bypass having to pull down the tree there to get as a grapple point. For the first few chapters, you're already well on your way to gaining more height than intended just because you have double jump when normally you wouldn't at this point. Here we're doing a precise jump to land on the ledge to our right, and that's going to allow us to gain extra height to be able to bypass this wall. However, when we bypass this wall, we land on the floor, but out of bounds. And because of that, we can move in such a way that we can bypass this arena and this huge door as well. Um, if you fail here, there is a way to recover this and get back over and back on path, but this is a fairly easy out-of-bounds. Nice little shot of the out-of-bounds geometry there. You can do a lot of out-of-bounds sightseeing in this game. It's actually kind of crazy. But uh, by doing that, we skipped over like three different arenas and having to break down that wall using bombs. So, underground caverns. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell because of the uh, video compression and stuff, but this game is also pretty visually stunning, especially for the time it came out. Some pretty good music in it also. We're using our sweet little whirly bird here to get rid of this spider quickly. So here, we're going to jump off, and this was a slight route change at the time, uh, by going down this path with a very structured jump here, we can actually bypass a lot of the climbing that we would normally have to take with this path. I miss it the first time, which is fine. Uh, missing the second time means that this is now going to break about even if I make it this attempt. But yeah, this is uh, this turned out to be kind of clown shoes, which is unfortunate. Normally, you would land over here on this platform, or on the platform to my right there, and that would allow you to bypass that. We can jump over the web. Normally, the webs are like a balance beam that you have to get over, but it is possible to jump over them. Uh, it's kind of harder than you would expect because there's invisible walls to both sides of the webbing, so you have to jump pretty precisely. Uh, there's a big door in the background that normally you need two keys in order to open it. Uh, however, with a very, very structured high jump here, we can actually knock ourselves out of bounds in such a way that we can kind of break the scene. So this was kind of a bad stage, comparatively. But uh, still very, very difficult tricks inside of this game. A glitch finder for 3D games and a runner of 3D games, Akion, has mentioned that when I first started learning this game, he was like, yeah, Lords of Shadow is a really, really hard game to start with. And he wasn't kidding in. Uh, though there was some documentation, a lot of times the documentation was just this is possible rather than how to do it or the mechanics behind it or understanding what the goal was in any given situation. Uh, because of that, I pretty much had to backwards engineer almost all of the stuff that I found online. Uh, most of the people that I picked up stuff from were Findlestick, Satvara, Vipyazone, Akion himself, a couple other people as well with contributions. 
But a big shout out to Findlestick in particular for kind of compiling everything and making the first segment to run for this game. Uh, here we use Ultimate Shadow since it's our strongest damage per hit. Uh, with the boar, you can knock down doors with a charge attack. Uh, there I tried to go for a glitch charge, which I think I get here. Yeah, so normally you're supposed to get like kind of a big running start to hit the door, but you can actually do a charge in which you're right next to the door and it still works. Which is uh, what I call the glitch charge. You'll see that kind of a few more times here. Super sweet uh, out of bounds here. So normally there's a huge section of the game where you have to kind of go underground and platform over kind of this dilapidated city. But instead, we are going to take the subway and kind of run our way across here. So the idea here is we want to get into the arena above us, but we want to get into it away from the entrance. If you hit too close to the entrance, then you would trigger the arena, and that's not what we want. Uh, nice use of guillotine here in order to refresh our double jumps and to kind of stick to geometry. Uh, I ran into a tiny bit of trouble there uh, regarding sticking to the edge there, which was unfortunate. The funny part is, is this and the previous stage are things that I oftentimes don't really have issues with. But, you know, this game is hard. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that uh, contribute to making a good run. So by doing that, I pick up this lever that I use to kind of crank this switch to open up the door. Uh, normally, if you enter this arena normally, the there's a group of goblins that come and kind of take the lever and kind of run around the stage with it. Then you have to fight a greater lycanthrope, and we're not about that life. Gabriel is trying to make his way to bigger and better things. Waterfalls of Encarta. So this was one of the hardest nuts to crack when it came to the sequence breaks inside of it. Um, but by learning that you can stand on top of that statue to gain extra height, it made me getting on top of the invisible wall at the top of the stage here much easier. After that, I need to do a structured double jump to get back on this platform. It's actually a very thin strip of land there to land on. And then we are going to jump into the back of the stage and land over here. I hit death collision, but luckily I landed on the ground, so it saved my position, which was important. From here, we get on top of the tunnel to gain extra height, and then we use our high jump to be able to get inbounds through this wall. Uh, that skips over about 70% of the level, <laughs> to put it lightly. Uh, here, we are going to get into another arena, but before the enemies can actually activate, we are going to gain enough height to activate a grapple point on the opposite side of the ravine there. After this, we're going to get into a fight with a spider, and one of the special abilities of spiders is to spin web bridges. Uh, this bridge gets destroyed inside of the cutscene. However, since we have our backwards long jump, we can bypass having to get the spider or spinning the web by just jumping high enough to get over the invisible barrier blocking us. This is an example of using high jumps to be able to gain access to ledges that are much higher than intended. So normally you wouldn't be able to access these grapple points or these ledges until you defeat the enemies below, but if you can get high enough to change the camera position, then the points become active. What's really nice about this game also is because it's structured by levels, it's much easier to recover from any issues that come up. Um, one of the big pitfalls with God of War speedruns is depending upon how badly you botch particular tricks, you can get into a lot of trouble. It's impossible to climb this way, the game says, but uh, game's lying, as I just prove it there. Yeah, Karto's a super broken map. <laughs> it gets done in less than a minute. It's kind of uh, silly. So we're using a release here to be able to skip a climbing sequence and grab this grapple point. 
We're also going to be using some structured jumps here to bypass climbing sections. Uh, removing as many climbing sections as you can really is a huge increase to your time because even if you use kind of the fast jump shuffle across things, you're still spending a lot of time going from point A to point B. The intended route here is to get a key, which then opens up a bridge to another area and then get a second key to fully unlock this bridge. Uh, but there's actually just invisible stuff all around here that we can stand on, so it's not really an issue when we can jump nine times the amount we should be able to at any given time. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but I think you get the point. Doing a little bit of a high jump here because it's a little faster than climbing. Uh, this one is to trigger the second camera angle to get the grapple point. Still much faster to climb upwards because it's a pretty quick animation than to do like a huge high jump. Uh, this arena, unfortunately, there's no real way to skip. Uh, we can speed it up a little bit by using items to kill off imps. I would never do this in a non-full power run because it just takes too much resources. But for full power run, you know, save a second or two. To go over lore at this point, uh, Gabriel Belmont is trying to fight the evil that corrupts these lands and avenge his dead wife who is kind of caught in a limbo and unable to pass to the afterlife. At this point, he goes to Akarta and meets a mute girl and her defender, which is the Dark Knight, as you can see there. Uh, he's also met a, another member of his order called Zobek, who says that he will try to assist him in his travels. Uh, and says that Gabriel should go to the land of the Lycans, while he will move and prepare the way in the land of the vampires. So, Sanctuary of the Titans. This is the second Titan fight. I kind of glanced over one of the fast stages again, but... Uh, this Titan, once again, we're using the Dark Crystal in order to reduce the amount of times we need to hit ruins. Stomp always happens here, but it will be preceded by the mechanic that we need in order to start climbing the Titan. It's a little finicky to get this grab and then do the rotation. Sometimes it wants to work, sometimes it doesn't. So important to know how you need to climb certain titans, because if you don't know how far you need to move at any given time, you could spend a lot of extra time kind of moving about. See, like I had to hesitate there for one second, because apparently I was just a tiny bit too far to the right to get the grapple point to trigger. So the reason we're destroying this titan is because it's guarding the way to kind of the next section of the game on the way to the Lord of the Lycans, the Dark Lord of the Lycans. Along the way also, you remember we had the puzzle with the rotating rings where we had to speak to our wife in the afterlife. Uh, in that section we met the old god Pan, which is the leader of the forest. Kind of cryptically helps us here and there by giving us the ability to traverse between nations. It's complicated, let's put it that way. He turns into, like, a horse with ruins on. He turns into an eagle. It's very peculiar. Very important to not make mistakes on the Titans. Um, you can easily lose a minute to three minutes, depending on how badly you make a mistake or what phase of the fight you're in. So it's important to stay focused during these times, especially near the end here. Uh, at the end of this phase, we are going to have a QTE where we have to grab the dark crystal that's flying through the air. If we don't, then we get knocked down and it takes forever to get back up to this position. So important to hit your QTEs. Uh, luckily, this game's QTEs aren't like a specific button per se. It's just timing. Uh, you'll see two rings and one ring will kind of shrink into the other. As long as you hit any of the normal action buttons when it hits, the two rings going to intersect, you succeed. 
Uh, we are doing this on Squire difficulty, which is the lowest difficulty setting in the game. Uh, it doesn't change much of anything other than the HP totals on enemies and the amount of damage they deal. Uh, one of the biggest problems I have with Lords of Shadow as a casual game is that the HP totals are so inflated on bosses, like fights last way longer than they need to. And this mitigates this quite a bit. This is the Dark Knight. Um, he does not get super totaled by Dark Crystal Breaks because he's a bean of dark magic. Uh, but it is still a sizable amount of damage that we can deal. Light magic kind of does a number on him, which is nice. Uh, you want to try to attempt to turn off magic when you do the QTE grab against the knight, and the reason for that is it has a much higher probability of spawning elemental orbs, which you can absorb. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like I was getting kind of double taps on my controller or something, which made that kind of difficult. Uh, this fight becomes considerably longer if you are unable to use full power. Not like a huge amount, but enough that uh, you kind of need to vary your strategy. For example, you can't use the Dark Crystal because you save the first Dark Crystal you ever have in order to defeat that second Titan. Nice and easy QTE to uh, finish off this boss. I have to menu through all of these stages, by the way, in order to get to the next section. Uh, whenever you complete a chapter or start a chapter, you need to start from the opposite side of the map, which is kind of frustrating, but you can learn to live with it. Uh, here we're using the supercharged dark power punch of the glove to be able to move this thing and break it through the wall. Normally you have to do a charged punch to get it to move, but using dark magic we instantly get a powerful punch. A little bit of a jerk thing for that werewolf to do. <laughs> he just slapped me as I was coming off the edge. Uh, that's pretty uncommon for that to happen. But, I mean, he was doing his best. So we want to do kind of a normal jump here, because if we do a double jump, we would land on the platform above. In the next arena, we're going to get introduced to fairies, or we normally would. Uh, using those fairies, the idea of this stage is to traverse all over these three massive colossal towers and gain access to some fairies from fairy springs around the level uh, to use their magic to unlock a door. Since we already have three fairies in our possession, we can just bypass this door using a very, very tall, long, or very, very tall high jump. To get on top of the door. A lot of times like it seems like you're safe with height, but it's always better to be safe than sorry, especially when large quantities of holy water are concerned. Uh, also the checkpointing in this game, while good casually, is not necessarily the best for speedrunning. Uh, we bypass having to do an arena and break down this wall by doing that high jump. And since we already have three fairies, we can bypass running around the level and just access this door immediately. So now we're coming to the first big bad, uh, the first Lord of Shadow, Cornell, the Dark Lord of the Lycans. Um, but after talking to him for a little bit, we realize that we have much more in common than we first thought. And uh, we decide that our friendship has transcended the boundaries of darkness and evil. Uh, he gives me his boots, and uh, I just leave on the back of an eagle. And, uh, you know, the friendship's the important thing. Not that we fight over some silly mask piece. Sweet picture of Pan's eagle there. Mountain Fortress is another very technical level. Uh, a big part of this game is understanding where you are inside of the level since the camera is so often not focused on you or you are blocked by different pieces of textures and geometry. So you need to have kind of a keen understanding of where you are in space and what can be around you. Nice little skip of a climbing section here. Um, I get kind of a slower version of that, but that's still much faster than the intended route. 
this is going to be a good example of what I was talking about uh, just now, where I was talking about how you don't really see your character too often. And that was one of the big struggles with backwards engineering this route, was just using audio cues to kind of feel around and then just really hitting the grindstone to understand what could go wrong and how it could go wrong. This jump off of the cliff is rather difficult because more times than not you grab onto the ledge. Uh, we jump out of bounds and then use the landslide punch to slam back to the ground to make sure we land on solid ground. We're then running and jumping to the background there, and it's important that we hit the lower section. Uh, right now we're on the upper platform, so we need to fall down very carefully. That way we can go underneath the trigger for the chupacabra. Uh, chupacabras are these little demons that take away your relic powers. Normally the intent is for you to run around kind of a puzzle platforming section to find them and recover them. But by doing this huge out of bounds and this big high jump to get on the ledge, we can bypass that and a huge ogre fight as well. Entering the mountain fortress, we are now going to be doing the crow witch stage. The Crow Witch is Malthus, very different interpretation of it from the traditional handheld games of the Castlevania series. Big portion of this is bypassing some large fences. The large fences are supposed to be broken by groups of crows that spawn when you defeat arenas. But with our very, very powerful double jump boots and some ingenuity, we can bypass them and move on to the next section. Uh, this is another example of a high jump used to activate a grapple point before a camera change is normally available. We still need to get high enough to activate it, as you can see there. Uh, talking a little bit more about high jumps, uh, besides double jumping, uh, your avalanche punch in the air can be used to gain small quantities of height about three times in each jump. Uh, you can also use holy water, which kind of pushes you up and forward by a pretty significant amount. Uh, it also slows your descent, which makes your high jumps much easier to do. Using this, you get about maybe six holy waters and three avalanche punches per jump to gain for height. Uh, that being said, holy water is not something that's guaranteed, especially if you're not doing full power. Uh, so because of that, you need to budget your holy water appropriately. Also, holy water is very strong offensively in certain situations and defensively, so you need to keep that in mind. Crow Witch, uh, what we need to do here is throw eggs back at her to damage her. Um, if we're lucky, we can actually throw back multiple eggs at her. Uh, this time, unfortunately, we did not. Uh, you want to try to throw two to three eggs back at her, but that's not always possible. Uh, the way that eggs are thrown back is by kind of a buffer strategy using grabs. But the problem is, is that slowdown that occurs when she throws her first set of eggs can mess up your inputs and eat them, which is not great. Here we should definitely be getting multiple throws though, yeah. The other nice thing about getting multiple throws is you don't need to deal with the enemies that spawn from the eggs afterward, if that happens. It is possible to two cycle this boss. Usually it comes down to a three cycle. And again, that just comes down to if you are able to get a uh, three egg throw on phase one. Unfortunately, you can't skip that. If you're wondering about the little 8-bit Simon on the left side of the screen, uh, that is to indicate that the cheat is on for all upgrades, as mentioned. Interestingly enough, it also kind of shows you what state your character is in, like when you attack the little Simon animation attacks, when you jump, he jumps, etc. So we got a crow storm there, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, that pattern costs a little bit of time, but not too much. This very much is a game that is, it's getting optimized, but there's a lot of it is based on your ability to get the skips and to execute strategies in the macro sense. 
Um, kind of the bit to bit inside of the game is less important than being able to hit these skips consistently and solidly with the least amount of resources and time that uh, you can get away with. So we're going to be closing up the Crow Witch here. And uh, moving on into the land of the vampires. Land of the vampires encompasses the next two or three chapters. So it's kind of a long trek into what will eventually become Dracula's castle in later games. For right now, we're in the outskirts of the area, making our way into the land of the vampires. Veros Woods has recently gotten an overhaul. For the purposes of this run, uh, we're going to see our Chupacabra, the only one we're going to see inside of this route. He steals our relics, and because of that, we have to kind of go through this stage a little bit slowly. Uh, if I can master it, there is an infinite jump technique to be able to bypass that Chupacabra. So I'm going to try to work on that over the next couple months. But we'll have to see what happens with that. Uh, as it stands, because this game is still fairly punishing on mistakes made and the techniques are so drastically difficult... You'll notice that I am putting a pretty large buffer on between my PB and what I am submitting as the amount of time for the game. And again, that's just due to kind of the volatility of each of these skips and the difficulty in doing them. Also, I would need to understand like what hardware is available at the venue and practice accordingly is a big part of it as well. Here we're using the fairies to be able to stop the goblins from attacking me while I deal with the spore and break down the door. Uh, fairies, very underutilized and underappreciated from a casual perspective. Uh, they're really, really powerful for controlling enemies. Uh, and even large enemies like this boar or the greater lycanthropes can become susceptible to them. So they're kind of a uh, underutilized tool with a lot of utility options. So here, we need to release at least one fairy to occupy the Chupacabra with our gear, otherwise he runs away from us and zaps us with lightning if we try to jump onto the platform. But we grab him, and we make good old voice-modulated Hideo Kojima give us back our gear. You'll sometimes see me use that stomp. Uh, the stomp is just a very, very fast way to get back down on the ground. Or sometimes you can use it to cause a glitched standing state, which is useful for uh, positioning certain skips. Really, really awesome screenshot here. Unfortunately, I don't think the video and encoding is going to do it justice, but just seeing the castle there in the background is super cool. I would say that's one of the biggest technical troubles with streaming this game is because there's so many particle effects and like rain and snow and stuff uh, and flashes, it can do a number on encoding. So we're going to slam down out of bounds here. This is Wygal Village. Normally you're supposed to run through the village and clear the graveyard of ghouls and then make your way into the mausoleum. But uh, by going out of bounds here, we can actually get underneath the mausoleum and hit the end of level trigger. Abbey Catacombs, this is a level where I started to implement some segmented strats. Uh, you're supposed to kill off these vampires and then go to the left and right sides of the next chamber to battle the traps of the abbot of Wygal and uh, then use the keys gained there to gain access to the library itself. However, with a structured high jump, we can make our way to the back side of the final puzzle and then trigger the final section. By getting this camera change, we load up the end of level and can move on. Abbey Library is one of my favorite stages because it gets to really show you a background look at the game design. Uh, anybody who knows anything about 3D modeling will kind of get a kick of this next section when I go to bounce here. Yeah, kind of <laughs> nice untextured stuff.
So this is the safe strategy for here, where we now get inbounds. And once we get inbounds, we are then going to solve a very quick puzzle to progress further on into the library. There is another strategy that you could do where you go further from this section and bypass the puzzle door. Uh, however, at this point, it's kind of risky and difficult to execute. Uh, it requires you to do a shadow charge off a ledge, which we might get into later. Uh, the short end of it is that you get very inconsistent mobility and fall speed on that, so it's rather dangerous. Puzzle's pretty quick to do anyway with some dark magic amplifying it. Here we're jumping towards the screen here to go through a wall and over a gate. And even though the camera is not going to change, we're going to be in the final hallway at that point and can trigger the end of level trigger. So now we're at the Abbey Tower. Um, we tried to use a charge there to bypass that short cutscene, but sometimes that just doesn't happen. Uh, there is a strategy where you can jump over the wall at the beginning and continue on. However, I found that this is much more consistent and is pretty reasonably fast as well. Uh, we definitely want to clear these first few enemies, these imps inside of the screen, before we make this jump. Otherwise, they could give us a lot of trouble as we try to make that. Uh, here, it's important that we kill off all of the imps. Uh, if we do not kill off all the imps, they will follow us as we try to climb up. And if they follow us as we try to climb up, it will cause certain platforms to not have the ability to grab onto them. It will cause this grapple point coming up to not become active. Just very important that we clear out those imps. Uh, I use the light-powered fairies, which make them turn into kind of homing time bombs. Uh, another resource you could use, you could use the Dark Crystal to just clear all of the ones that are present on screen. If you do the other strategy where you jump over the wall itself at the beginning of the level, you keep those guys from spawning. But that runs into its own problems with collision detection and uh, appropriately getting over the wall in a fast manner. Uh, while this is slower and consumes some resources, uh, it's much more consistent, and full power means we don't need to worry about the resources, really. So once we reach the top of the village, uh, we learn that the abbot, who is now blind, has been hiding the sacred holy water relic, which he could have used to help the town of Weigal, but selfishly hid away and kind of trapped himself in to save his life. Uh, we then take it from the old man who is then beset by vampires and killed. On uh, this stage, we return to the village of Weigal to find that it's being set on fire by a group of vampires led by the commander Bronner. And uh, apparently Bronner's been really hitting the weights since Portrait of Ruin. Because uh, he's pretty swole. Been hitting the juice. Getting regular injections of the gas. We use ultimate light here in the corner because it hits faster than ultimate shadow. So even though per hit ultimate shadow does more damage, uh, if you're able to corner an enemy so that ultimate light is constantly on them, it will do more damage on a DPS scale. So I guess something to mention, when you're charged with shadow magic, you do more damage. When you're charged with light magic, you regenerate health, is the basic mechanic of those. Uh, you can get magic via mana fonts, where like they're fountains that you can fill up your magic at. Or if you do a big enough combo on enemies with attack variety, then they spawn neutral elemental orbs that you can absorb as well. Yeah, the... Uh, Boss kill animations here are kind of a big casualty, because a lot of them are super cool, but uh, for the sake of the speed rut, we must skip them. Sewer is another place where you would normally fight a couple of arenas involving skeletons, which are very resilient, and then solve a couple puzzles. However, once we stand on top of this pipe and back jump into the background here, we can hit the end of level trigger for that particular fight. 
Maze Gardens. Uh, this is another level that took quite a while for me to kind of break open. Uh, getting that jump is kind of nice. Reduces the amount of time you need to spend climbing up. Sorry, this is the... Uh, this is the castle wall. Not the maze gardens. So by standing on top of here, we can jump out of bounds and trigger the next part of the scene, which makes us fall into an arena. However, if we restart from checkpoint, the game gives us back our double jump, and that allows us to jump out of the arena as we're falling. Once we do that, we're going to hit a lever here. We're going to use fairies in order to distract the skeletons that are spawning behind us at this point. Yeah, look at these idiots. If you get there fast enough, it is possible to crank that without using the fairies, but fairies are cheap insurance. So yeah, here we go. Here's Maze Gardens. So the big thing about Maze Gardens, you're normally supposed to get access to a spider to spin a couple of web bridges and then use their strength to kind of pull apart some gates. But with a very, very structured jump on top of this statue and then a very, very precise high jump, we can bypass an enormous invisible wall that normally blocks us off from going to this puzzle. So this keeps us from having to get the spider early on and backtracking. Puzzle's fairly simple. Because we didn't spin that web bridge though, the game still has that invisible wall spawned. Because of that, we are going to have to restart from checkpoint. By restarting from checkpoint, the game automatically spins the web bridge that we should have at this point and removes the invisible wall. From here, we still do need access to the spider. Uh, we are still going to use it in order to open up the gates that I referred to earlier. Kind of important to be careful about how the smaller enemies are spawning here, because if we hit the spider as a smaller enemy is on top of him, we could potentially double hit with ultimate shadow and kill the spider, which then means we have to wait for another one to spawn. Gabriel Belmont, master spider tamer, by the way. The reason we go back to the maze garden is the front door to the vampire's keep is locked by a magical seal, which requires a key that we just obtained at that fountain. Uh, this key is going to allow us to access the castle itself. If you remember, this is the screen from a couple stages ago that we had to go through. And we get to enter the castle. So Castle Hall. Uh, normally there's an extended fight of about four different arenas and a couple of light-based puzzles that you use. Uh, we're going to use some fairies here to distract those vampires that you saw at the beginning of the level while we crank this. Uh, very important to have enough fairies to be able to do this strategy because otherwise... Vampires are rather resilient if you don't have access to holy water, and you need to kind of tear down some curtains to spawn light over a pit that they come from. Uh, this high jump is kind of rough. Uh, sometimes you can get pushed out of it due to some odd geometry on it. But as long as you're able to execute it, it allows you to skip all of those arenas and a chess minigame that you would normally have to play with Laura. We're now making our way to the refectory. The refectory has a lot of stuff happening inside of it. You get introduced to ghouls, uh, you get introduced to the butcher, who's kind of a mini-boss of the stage. But since we do not need the butcher's key to bypass the door in front of us, uh, we will not be seeing him. At least not without some type of incentive. Uh, this jump's a little bit tricky, as you might be able to tell. Uh, we're trying to get on top of the lances here to be able to facilitate a high jump that will get us out of bounds. So a little bit rough here to get this first one. 
This is another one that I typically get fairly quickly. We just ran into some trouble this time. Uh, we skip the scene here and then restart from checkpoint to spawn inbounds on the other side of the door. Uh, from here, there is an out-of-bounds you can do to skip the door in the background. Uh, however, it's much easier and pretty comparable time-wise to just do the puzzle. Uh, these particular sigils on the wall or reliefs on the wall need to be charged with a specific color magic in order to release their lock on the door. We release some fairies here to occupy the skeletons in the background here. Important that we don't trigger light magic before releasing the fairies, or else they would turn into bombs rather than giving us our distraction that we need. So, you look at that map and you go, oh, we're hitting the halfway point of the game. I mean, we kind of are, but at the same time, chapters are much shorter as we move forward. We've kind of gone through many of the chapters that have a large amount of stages. And certain stages, as mentioned, get kind of broken in half at times. So inside of this stage, you're intended to fight a couple of arenas, make your way to the top of this section, and then traverse the side of the buildings to find a side path where some skeletons and a magical armor are guarding a key for this gate. Uh, luckily, we can bypass this gate fairly easily with some good old holy water magic. We also stay out of bounds here so that we can get through this next gate. Otherwise, we would need to solve a puzzle in order to bypass it. And then we just hit the end of level trigger. Electric Laboratory. Um... So this is another one that could be broken by infinite jumping to get out of bounds. Uh, but again, this particular run doesn't use that strategy. So this first part is going to be rather intended. Uh, the next room, however, is not so much. So in the next room, you're intended to kind of push around a statue, activate several nodes to change electrical flow and such. Uh, but if we do a back roll into this electricity, we don't get knocked away that much. And that allows us to hit this switch on the opposite side of the room that we shouldn't have access to. And by hitting it a few times, we can change the current of electricity to progress through the scene. Nice little trick there. If you approach it normally, you would get knocked back considerably further, but the back roll is the critical point there. This is a very, very difficult step that took me forever to figure out how to do. Um, we're going to want to get on top of this breakable wall and then move towards the left here. That's going to get us out of bounds near the boss arena, but still out of bounds. We then have to very, very carefully move around this section. Um, if we move too far to the side, we start falling infinitely, which is the main concern whenever you're doing an out of bounds. Uh, now we need to do that same back roll into this electricity. By doing that back roll into this electricity, we can grab the lens through the wall, and that allows us to move into the end of level trigger. If you don't move into the end of level trigger fast enough after picking up the lens, then you get sucked into the boss arena. So it's important to move safely, but also quickly. This is an example of guillotine, the air moves used to stick to terrain that you shouldn't be able to. We are also using an extended backwards long jump to be able to move further into the background behind the scene here. Uh, we kind of get caught in an awkward position, but it's still better to take that awkward positioning than to try to reattempt the jump and potentially fail the guillotine. Um, at this point, though, it's kind of rough. Uh, uh, this keeps you from having to go into several different rooms to get chromatic lenses to do kind of light puzzles and arenas. Uh, here, we are fighting some job squads here. These puppets are very durable, uh, and you need to defeat them with a grab attack. Uh, if you just use like a dark crystal to kill them instantly, they respawn. Uh, so you have to use this grapple attack in order to kill them. Luckily, after they die, they spawn lots of neutral elemental orbs and give you dark magic. So because of that, you're able to relatively quickly deal with them. 
especially with the reduced HP on Squire. Nice and easy. There's actually a kind of funny cutscene before this where Alora calls you a cheater <laughs> and tells you you're going to pay. At this point, it's kind of a marathon staple for me to let it play out. It sends in the sweet Twin Galaxies Enforcers to try and beat you down. So Laura is originally going to try to kill you, but she backs off from it when she sees Marie uh, and realizes kind of the power of love, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, Laura is kind of an immortal vampire that was changed by the Dark Lord of the Vampires when she was still a child. So even though she's quite old and quite evil and powerful, she is still very much a uh, petulant child at heart. So some climbing sections here to be able to get up the last section of the castle walls. There is an arena here that segues into a magic puzzle. But we're going to bypass this fence instead and make our way into the heart of the castle instead. So some kind of interesting situational things that are going to be happening here. Uh, we're going to be using fairies to occupy these imps so that we can pull this gate switch. That way we're going to be able to not have to defeat them. Save a little bit of time. So when we get inside of this room, normally you're supposed to pick up a key off of a body, and then with the animation, the gate closes off. However, using that move the move where I hold out my cross, uh, we break the animation. That's called a Holy Cross Breakout. A breakout is a general term where you break out of a pre-canned animation and you're allowed to move freely or change the way you move as a result of it. Because of that, we cancel out Gabriel's animation where he bends down to pick up the key and we can move during that and are allowed to leave the room before it gets locked off by the gate. Some nice ice skating here. Um, if you do a run on certain types of uneven terrain, sometimes it will renew your run, but it'll kind of make you stutter step. Looks kind of goofy, but it is actually slightly faster. Because you don't have to uh, redo your run. Clock Tower. Clock Tower can be a very fancy stage. Um, I kind of do a half fancy thing here. We bypass the first entire floor by making that jump. Um, we're going to be bypassing about half of the second floor by doing another pretty fancy jump. Uh, unfortunately, this level is programmed relatively well when it comes to triggers. Uh, if it was not, we could use the new infinite jump trick to just jump to the top of the level. But unfortunately, you do need to crank these levers and bring this central platform to the top before the end of level trigger even spawns, which is kind of frustrating. So, nice little jump here. So this wasn't the best jump, but since I have full power, I can kind of try to make it work. And that's just kind of very, very slowly, but intentionally extending my jump. And there I use a landslide punch to extend the last little bit onto the ledge. Here I tried to do a technique where you can slide across the ledge there at the far end uh, to bypass a climbing phase. Unfortunately, I didn't get it either attempt, but it's fine. Short time loss. Here we bypass the rest of this floor by double jumping and grabbing onto that grapple point. Uh, luckily, it activates off-screen, so that is a little bit of a generous thing from the game. There's a technique that you can do here that involves um, allowing this guy to kind of follow you around the lever so that you can finish doing the lever and then jump over an invisible wall to complete the stage. 
However, I was finding in practice that it's very inconsistent to happen. It requires this guy to do specific moves and to kind of cooperate with you. So in practice, what I was finding is it's better to just get him to spawn, drop it, and then continue on. It could potentially still be faster if you got the crank, but you didn't have the positioning to get out of bounds and get to the end of level trigger, but that still would be kind of pushing it. It would still require you to do the manipulation well and hope that he doesn't do certain movements or that his AI doesn't bug out particularly hard. So we're at the end of the clock tower. We're using the ultimate light, which actually can be used across balance beams in order to speed your way across them. A little bit of a waste of light magic, but again, since this is full power, I don't need to worry about conservation of resources. This is Ulrox. Ulrox is a brutal fight normally, and this skip is not at all easy. Um, I'm going to make it kind of look easy, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's rough. So we're going to try to very, very carefully land on top of this chain. And then we are going to use a high jump followed by a backwards long jump in order to make our way over this door and hit the end of level trigger. The hard part here is the end of level trigger is positioned at a very, very awkward part in the stage. And so because of that, I actually missed it there. Um, I did not move appropriately to be able to hit it, and I didn't get the best out of bounds to facilitate that. Because of that, I have to retry the stage. Um, even if I have to retry this a bunch of times, this skip seriously saves like four to six minutes, depending on how poorly the fight goes. Because not only does it get past this extremely grueling fight, it also stops you from having to deal with a puzzle at the end that's kind of an auto-scroller. There I was able to move in such a way that I could hit the end of battle trigger. Uh, kind of a rough casualty of that is the Ulrox kill is actually one of the coolest kills in the game. But, you know, sacrifices have to be made, especially when it's that much time gain. This is the Dark Lord of the Vampires, Carmilla. Uh, first section here is very easy. We're just using Holy Water to be able to kill her vampire slaves. Uh, after that, using a Dark Crystal at the beginning here kind of gets you through this first phase a little faster and kills her two adds before they can cause problems. After this, we want to try to drag her into a corner with ultimate light to do damage as quickly as we can. Move on to phase three. For phase three, we're gonna to try to drag her into a corner using ultimate light, or sorry, using ultimate shadow and then go back to ultimate light once we've pulled her back there. Again, when possible, you want to try to use ultimate light. It's a little bit dangerous because during the transition from ultimate shadow to ultimate light, she could go into an air phase, but still worth the cost, I think. So here we use the dark gauntlet to be able to absorb the power she was shooting at us to break her holy shield that she makes over herself. So enjoy this pretty sweet cutscene. Uh, you know, this is one of the things that isn't a casualty of the run, uh, because there's going to be considerable amounts of QTEs that happen in this, so because of that we can't skip them. Really, really cool scene though. Uh, very important not to make a mistake on QTEs though, because if you mess up QTEs here, that's like two to three minutes lost. <laughs> so yeah, very important to pay attention during this. Super, super cool though. Good old Gabo Belmont fighting his way through. So there's a lot of people that are like, Richter's the strongest Belmont. You know, Julius is the strongest Belmont. They're, they're provably wrong with what Gabriel does in this game. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they might defeat Dracula a bunch, 
but uh, they don't nearly fight the last boss that uh, Gabriel does in Lords of Shadow 1 and 2. So now that we've defeated the Dark Lord of the Vampires, this is where you would normally get double jump. So if you were to do like a new game run of this, this is the point at which the new game run and the new game plus run would look somewhat similar. The main problem between the two runs would be that you would have less access to holy water. Uh, there are various upgrades to capacity inside of this game, and if you did a new game run, you wouldn't necessarily have as much holy water as you would in New Game Plus. But at this point, you have your major tools uh, in double jump, cyclone boots for faster movement speed, and holy water to assist in your high and long jumps. So the funny part is this is where the game expects you to be able to jump super high. So the game should be based around that, right? A little bit more stable with uh, the addition of double jumps. Kind of. I mean, again, even though we gain double height with the double jump, or about double height, we're still gaining about three times as much height when we include avalanche punches, uh, holy Waters, and Extends using Landslide Punch. Uh, I use a Dark Crystal to clear this arena immediately. The reason for that is by clearing this arena, I create a checkpoint here. So that if I need to redo the next skip, I will start from here rather than the beginning of the stage. Uh, that arena is skippable, but I think that is a much safer and more consistent strat. Uh, this is a Chupacabra skip. This is another very, very difficult skip. The reason for that is we need to grab this side ledge rather than land on top of it, which is kind of a little difficult. Then we need to jump towards the screen to avoid the collision on the top of the tree canopy. But after we launch over, we need to slam ourselves into the ground in such a way that we trick the game into thinking we land on solid ground. That allows us enough time to jump out of that. If we didn't trick the game into thinking we're on solid ground, there's a slope that actually slopes you back into the cutscene. And then you would have to go around chasing the Chupacabra, uh, tame some swamp trolls. Just very protracted sequence. Rest of the stage is relatively straightforward. Um, just trying to reduce the amount of climbing that we have to do at any given point. Uh, there is a strategy where I could have jumped onto the side to the right there, but I had been having kind of some trouble having it happen. It only saves about two seconds, so I figured I'd just give up those two seconds since I was on a pretty strong pace run. Uh, any run that I can get that gets past Ulrox is a good run, because <laughs> that Ulrox skip is brutal. Uh, we still have a few more brutal skips as well to go past as well. Uh, Woesmore. This is another really, really awesome level. Probably my second favorite level next to Avery Library. And again, you get to see in a, a real quick look at the development team's ideas and how they worked around a level. So this level, you're supposed to have a puzzle where you move scarecrows to... Or crows, rather, to a scarecrow. The scarecrows then activate into mini-bosses. After you defeat those mini-bosses, they drop keys. But if you look at this stage, the keys actually exist underneath the level, even before the bosses spawn. And because of that, by getting out of bounds, we can run around and pick up these keys. After we pick up all the keys, we restart from checkpoint so that we get back inbounds, but we still keep the keys that we picked up. We're going to get a shot of the crows I was talking about that you're supposed to manipulate with a puzzle. Um, it's a pretty basic kind of circuit puzzle where it's like you want to block uh, the movement of crows with other crows and force them to move in a certain way. This is the music box. Uh, the music box is kind of a puzzle platforming section. Um, there's not going to be too much happening inside of this, but I'll try to point it out where I can. It plays a rendition of Bloody Tears in music box form, which is pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, uh, there is a music box skip 
where you can get out of bounds and skip the majority of the music box. However, as of the time of this submission and when I was playing this game, I have not been able to confirm the music box skip on PC version of the game. Um, I've confirmed almost every other skip and technique inside of the game, but not this one. Uh, because of that, uh, this is not entirely an auto-scroller, but it's a good portion timed. Uh, all we're doing here is we're man manipulating the colors on that console in order to make certain traps spawn in a certain order. Uh, then we pick up other cylinders which give us additional colors. Nice place to kind of decompress a little bit. You still want to pay attention, but... Uh, as long as you're moving well and paying attention, it's not too difficult. So this is one of the like kind of more difficult things, is the fire puzzle. Um, it is possible to make a mistake because the timing is a little bit more strict in this area than it is in others. We're going to use the shadow charge here because it's a faster form of burst movement than our other options. That allows us to get past the fire there. Rolling towards the switch there is faster than using the run due to the extra inputs. Uh, if we do not have access to running using the cyclone boots, rolling is your next fastest option. Uh, we only really use that as tech inside of the snowy forest that you saw quite a bit of time ago. And we use it there in order to get to the Chupacabra who had stole our relics. I get plenty of time here, so I just kind of mess around and block in tune with the music. <laughs> Not really a lot you can do to style on in this game. Not without losing time, at least. So, we have now picked up Blue Rose for Baba. And after we pick up Blue Rose for Baba, she teleports us to the Titan Graveyard. That would be uh, Baba Yaga, by the way, the uh, witch of European folklore. So, Titan's Graveyard is kind of a rough place as well. Um... The execution of both of it, most of it isn't too bad, but there are some places that are rather inconsistent in how you need to approach them, and as a result of that, it can be it can be easy to lose a good run here to things just not going the way you want to. So some basic platforming there, and uh, using a couple high jumps in order to reduce you're climbing. Uh, there is a way to jump down this entire section, but it seems to be contingent on kind of frame perfect or close to frame perfect slams, like that stomp. Uh, because of that, I just do this climbing section, which is still pretty quick. Um, if I ever took more than like two deaths on trying to bypass that climbing section, it would instantly start losing time. And uh, it's pretty inconsistent, especially on the APC version. These are the coffin enemies. They're very, very durable and difficult to fight if you don't have holy water or a dark crystal. So we're not going to fight them. We're going to get on top of this invisible platform and jump on this stone arm that's invisible right now. Normally you would pick up a piece of a ruin and power the arm that's adjacent to that arena and it would kind of extend and move across to create a bridge. Here we use a ultimate light to hover over this fart gas. Besides being able to go over balancing platforms, ultimate light also has the ability to go over swamp terrain. So this is the difficult part. Um, this particular boost onto this platform is very inconsistent uh, due to camera positioning, collision, and the way that avalanche punches and landslide punch extends work. Second try is very good, um, and I'm able to do a high jump here to change camera position. So you saw the camera swung around. That's very important. Uh, that requires me to gain enough height and enough distance 
away from there that it changes that camera position. Once that camera position changes, the end of battle trigger loads, and even though I'm walking through the poison swamp and taking damage, I can still hit the end of level trigger without any issue. So very, very important to uh, get that camera change and move in a structured way. We're now going to fight Pan. He says, ha ha, I took your magic. Let's see how strong you are without it. He forgot to take our dark crystal, though, so uh, we use that to do a little bit of damage. Uh, this fight is supposed to teach you some basic mechanics for the final section of the game. Um, for this section, you're supposed to kind of parry and use your parries to do extra damage to him since you don't have your magic power to kind of facilitate combat better. After you break it, he gives you back your light magic, but then you learn he has light magic as well. Uh, he teaches you that if a person has light magic on, you can't use light magic and hurt them. Uh, you need to either use your normal attack or dark magic, which you don't have right now. So because of that, I'm using the parry ability, and then when he turns off his light magic, I switch to light to do ultimate light to finish off this phase. Just fisticuffs all over this old god right now, by the way. Just beating down this old goat. So now he switches over to shadow, and again, you can't beat shadow with shadow. So after I charge him, I immediately switch to light to be able to finish him off. Uh, hardest cutscene in the game now. Uh, pretty quick moving. And not only is it kind of quick moving, but it moves across the screen, so it can be kind of hard to focus on. Uh, there is a faster cutscene that is in the Gravedigger fight, but we skip the Gravedigger now, so that is now officially the hardest QT in the game. Nice little high jump here to bypass a climbing section. Uh, you could bypass this climbing section. I think I give it one attempt here. No, I don't even give it an attempt. Uh, you can jump off there and try to trigger the grapple point as you fall down. Um, pretty inconsistent, though. I've been trying to work on a way to make it work since it would be about a 10 to 15 second time save. But as of now, still out of my reach. What's not out of my reach is the next skip, which is another Chupacabra skip. So before backwards long jumping was discovered, this used to be a long protracted process of getting on top of invisible walls using shadow charges and all this other garbage. But with backwards long jump, we just need to get high enough to get over the arch and the chain there, and that allows us to skip the scene where the Chupa would take our gear. Small puzzle here, uh, you can use shadow charge punches to make it easier. I guess I can talk a little bit more about backwards long jumping. Uh, backwards long jumping is the technique that allows you to use your double jump while in midair after an extended jumping sequence. It allows you to jump higher than normally expected and gain much more control directionally over your jump. Um, it's, its invention is the main reason why this game is RTA viable. Before it was discovered, this game was just way too hard to do single segment. But uh, with its inclusion, there were a lot of skips that were made much, much easier, way more consistent. The difficulty was brought down as well. This is Gravedigger skip here. By getting underneath the stage and doing a very structured backwards long jump, we can avoid the many places of death collision there to land inside of this tower. We then use the grapple point to clip back into the tower. Uh, normally, you're supposed to fight Gravedigger, push him into this tower, and then he drags you down with him. Uh, and then you have to climb your way back up. But since we were able to clip through the tower itself, we can bypass fighting him entirely. I kind of skipped by it as I was talking about backwards long jumping. That and Ulrock skip are the two hardest skips in the game, by far. Um, now that I've got it past this point, I still have two major skips to do in Necromancer skip and Dracolich skip. But at this point, like I know I have a run. Like, there is a strong run potential at this point. I just got to finish up the last little bit. 
by jumping over this invisible wall, I bypass having to do a puzzle involving creating a eclipse inside of that hole in the rock in the background. Uh, using the infinite jump, there is a way to skip this next circle ring puzzle. Uh, however, I am not necessarily convinced it's a great idea to do it. Uh, it would save a considerable portion of time. However, if you miss it even like once at a later portion of the skip, then it would be faster to just do the puzzle itself. But if you're talking about like PB attempts or whatever, uh, it is a new skip that is very, very powerful. So all we're doing here is we're trying to tell how the line should be drawn on the wall using inputs correlating to the different rings on the circle. And none of this is skippable. So you can see, like, if you're able to do this long infinite jump to get over this puzzle, it would save quite a bit of time. But again, difficulty is... It's a thing. <laughs> it's definitely a thing. So continuing on with the stage here for Necromancer's Abyss. Uh, so funny thing about the portals, the portals actually have a relative spawn point of where you jump out of them. Like I jumped out of that moving up and left, so it spawned me in a way that I was still moving up and left. Uh, that's kind of an intricacy that's lost on a lot of players the first time they play the game. And because of that, you can skip a couple of climbing sequences. So very important to move through that first section quickly, because if you don't, you can miss this cycle on the elevator. That is on a global cycle from when the stage starts. It's not the worst thing in the world if you miss it, but it's a, you know, like 15, 12 second time loss. Uh, these cycles aren't as important because no matter how these things move, using double jumps and sprint jumps, you can make your way across there without much issue. Now we come to the hard part. Uh, this is Necromancer Skip. So the hard thing about Necromancer Skip is you are jumping blind to a platform that you can't possibly see. And until I really, really ground it down, I didn't even know where this platform existed in space. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump on top of this fence and then jump off of it, not to get past the fence, but to get out of bounds past it. As we're falling out of bounds, we need to angle ourselves in such a way that we fall onto a floating platform just underneath this platform. The hard part about it is that move he just did uh, locks your inputs, and I had to restart as a, uh, as a result of that. So when he spawns zombies with his summoning spell, your inputs get locked and you don't move. So because of that, I wasn't able to angle myself in the appropriate way to land inbounds. Because of that, I landed out of bounds in that area, and that made it so that I was unable to hit this switch right here. Uh, once you're out of bounds there, there's no real way that you can get back inbounds, which is unfortunate. So after you hit that switch, we still need to get back over the gate. Uh, we've activated the portal that's on the opposite side of the gate now, but we haven't opened the gate. So we do need to do the skip again. Um, again, very important this time to make sure that you get inbounds rather than out of bounds. So rough things that can happen here is the Necromancer can block the entrance to the gate and hit you, or he can block you with collision, or he can change the camera's direction so it messes up your inputs. Um, I have a suspicion the camera itself has collision as well, which can give you problems. Uh, these problems are also prevalent in the Olrox fight that I mentioned, where you have to get on top of the chain and do structured double jumps. It's even more difficult in Olrox skip because he has an ability that he can throw swords at you and they will home in on you from infinite range. Like, you can be the game's equivalent of 80 feet in the air, and they'll just home in on you and hit you while you're trying to do your uh, very, very precise skip, <laughs> which is pretty infuriating. Very, very quick fight with the Necromancer. Not too much to really cover with here. 
Just another fight where you dominate him using uh, Ultimate Shadow and Ultimate Light. So the rest of this stage is just some kind of basic platforming, moving around, trying to reduce the amount of climbing that you do, as mentioned before. So like this is one of those games that I feel like gets a really, really bad rap. Um, I don't think it's a great game, but it doesn't deserve nearly the hate it gets. And quite frankly, I think, as far as speedruns go, it is a fantastic speedrun. Um, very, very difficult to perform. But as far as, like, content and, like, all the various tricks that you do inside of it and the ways that you approach certain situations and just general speed concepts, it is fantastic. A lot of work went into this run on Glitch Finders uh, via, like, Findlestick, Vipia Zone, and... Um, set Vara to get this game where it's at now. And like, I'm just glad that I was able to kind of get this game into the RTA spotlight a little bit more by running it. But yeah, it really exemplifies all of the things that I love about speedrunning. Um, there's techniques for actually gaining speed, there's tons of glitches, lots of sequence breaks, uh, lots of interesting ways to approach different screens of movement. Um, tons of out of bounds and that style of glitch as well to facilitate that type of stuff. Very visually appealing as well, if I do say so myself. Here we do a double jump and grab a grapple point, which kind of like snaps us to the wall there. Kind of cool. So we're coming into the last couple stages of the game. Uh, still one one very very vital skip to hit uh, this is the Draco Lich skip so the Draco Lich is the final Titan uh, the idea of this final Titan is that you are supposed to grab a hold of it and then climb all over its monstrous worm like body uh, jump across ribs go forwards and backwards all over this thing uh, break a bunch of ruins you reach another phase where he starts flying upward and then you need to traverse the inside of his rib cage, uh, breaking more ruins. And then you get into phase three, or phase two I call it, where you have to fight the final ruin on his head. Um, it is a brutally long fight. It takes between six and eight minutes casually if you do it the intended way. And it's very punishing on a mistake. However, we can bypass that by getting on top of an invisible wall here and that platform in the background right there is actually where phase two occurs, or the last phase of the fight. By doing a particular shadow charge to gain extreme amounts of horizontal distance, and then finishing it off with a jump, we can trigger the final fight of the phase. Uh, the hard part here is, once again, getting the shadow charge off the cliff to give us sufficient horizontal space. This is a recovery tactic I developed, where you stop your in-air momentum to get the last little bick on a backwards long jump. Very difficult to do, but uh, it's a way you recover from that if you don't get enough horizontal range. We use a Dark Crystal here to make it so we only have to hit this final ruin once. Uh, even if you didn't use that, you only need to punch the Draco Lich a few times to finish it off despite it having a full health bar. Uh, the health bar is kind of glitched, and you only need to break that final ruin, since it assumes all the others are broken in order to get to that phase. This is the final fight, and it is with Satan. That's right, Satan. I'm not making a joke. This isn't me trying to aggrandize the situation or make Gabriel seem better. No, he is literally fist-fighting Satan and winning right now. Not only that, he's wearing the mask of, like, the mask of God, basically. And he's getting beaten down by Gabriel in a fist fight. Just divine fisticuffs all over the place. So, like, you know, people are like, Julius and Richter are the strongest. They never beat Satan. Twice. <laughs> 
So basic mechanic of this fight, uh, Satan has both light and dark magic, so you need to use moves that are opposite to him. Uh, he also has moves that are specific to light or dark magic that you can avoid by having that particular element up. Um, we saw it in the transition from phase one to phase two, but you'll see it at the end of this phase as well. Uh, his final protective move is a situation where he creates multicolored rings, uh, and you need to be the appropriate light or dark magic element to pass through the ring to get close enough to him to attack. Um, this is pretty much a slam dunk fight, honestly. Uh, this is a little frustrating that he would use this move. These landmines tend to make it kind of difficult to finish a fight. Uh, because of that, I'm going to lose a little bit of time here since he switches color. And he kind of sits in this landmine, which is frustrating. <laughs> nice way to lose, you know, like 10 seconds at the end of a run. But this run was absolutely fantastic all over the place. So here's an example of those rings that we need to change colors to bypass. And at the end of this, we call time when we hit our final QTE, which is coming up here. Don't want to make a mistake now, right? End of the game. And that's the end of the game. So, could very easily watch the end of the game uh, for the credits and stuff. That's another reason why I'm going to be a little bit generous with the end, or generous with the estimate as well. Um, I think the end of the game is pretty solid either. Uh, could watch the post credit stuff if wanted, but I think at least watching the very ending here is worthwhile. But, uh, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and let this play out. Take your hands off me, murderer. Your soul is damned. I ask forgiveness. Was that I am wrong? What I did, I did unknowingly. Yet I would change everything if I could. He isn't listening, Gabriel. Your fate is fixed. Every man has the power to repent. I have faith in that. Forgive me. Forgive me, my God. I will your Murray. I will introduce her to such pleasures. Her soul will go only to him. Once I have finished with you, angel. My love. I am alive. No. I do not want this. Why has my life been given back to me? It is your fate. You have been given back what was wrongfully taken from you. To repent your sins. To make amends. But without you... You freed them all. You saved us all, my Gabriel. I couldn't save you. I knew I could not tell you. 
or despair would have eroded your resolve and everything would have been lost. I had faith in you, hoped that you would be strong enough to free the world, and you did not let me down. I am not worthy of your faith, your love. I am nothing. You are a good man, Gabriel. You are as God intended, fallible, yet capable of great things. I loved you then, as I love you now. I see before me a man who has regained God's favor, and who has my forgiveness, and the forgiveness of all the lost souls of this world. You have saved us all, and you have saved yourself. The mask is a powerful device. It allows us to see through God's eyes. Can it really bring the dead back? Yes. Look. late for me, my love. I cannot come back. No. No, don't go. It is my time. The light is calling. I'm not no. afraid. Please, stay. Stay with me. It's beautiful, Gabriel. So beautiful. It's calling to me. Calling. I love you, Marie. I love you. Forgive me. There's an additional cutscene after this one um, that kind of sets up for Lords of Shadow 2, but uh, I think that'd be an easily fine way to end it. Uh, that's going to do it for my submission commentary for Castlevania Lords of Shadow New Game Plus Full Power. As mentioned, I will be doing a rather generous estimate to account for the difficulty and inconsistencies of the game. Um, I can also look into a New Game Plus non-full power run if that is desired. But uh, that's going to do it for me. Thank you for watching. Perhaps I will see you at the marathon running this game and showing off Gabo Belmont.